On the line with us is Dr. Sylvia A. Earl, the president and chairman of Mission Blue, or the National Geographic Explorer at Large, former chief scientist with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the author of a new book, National Geographic Ocean, A Global Odyssey. The, web, the website is mission-blue.org, and you can follow Dr. Earl on Twitter at Sylvia Earl, E-A-R-L-E, -E, or at Mission Blue. Dr. Earl, welcome to the program. Uh, what is the state of our oceans right now? What, uh, wh where are they at relative to where they were, say, 100 or 200 years ago? Well, there's good news and there's bad news. For sure, we know more mm -hmm. than we did 100 years ago or 50 or even 10 years ago. The rate of exploration, of understanding the ocean, of being able to connect the dots, if you will, with the computer technologies that now take this massive amount of new information and make it more widely available. And we have the technology to explore that didn't exist 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. Technology high in the sky, technology deep in the sea. So although we, I think, now understand the magnitude of our ignorance in a way that we didn't a hundred years ago. We we really understand that the ocean is in trouble. We can see that we could not see before how climate and ocean are inextricably linked. Without the ocean, there would basically be no climate. <laughs> it would be rocks and water, or, or rocks and a little bit of water, but the ocean is where 97% of Earth's water is. And it's not just water and rocks, it's alive. And it's the living ocean that generates oxygen, captures carbon, drives the great cycles of life that shape planetary chemistry in our favor. No ocean, no life, no, yeah. no humans without the ocean. Now we know that, we did not. One of, one of the major ocean systems that affects our weather, uh, and by our, I mean literally the, the entire planets, is sometimes referred to as the Great Conveyor Belt, uh, the uh, AMORC, if I'm remembering the acronym right. I don't remember what it stands for. But, you know, the system that brings warm water from the, the South Pacific Ocean around, south around the southern tip of Africa, up along the, the uh, eastern coast of South America, Central America, and the United States, and then out to uh, just off the coast of England where, you know, it meets the cold water and, and settles. And there's concern that the increasing freshwater melt from Greenland in particular um, is, is uh, interfering with the ability of that system to operate and that if it fails, that the consequences could be catastrophic, at least for human civilization. Where is, where is our understanding of that at and, and how is that system doing these days? The whole concept of understanding the cold currents driven by the melt of polar ice sinking the, the more dense, heavier cold water and moving beneath the surface waters, upwelling in various places, driven by the rotation of the earth, driven by the winds, driven by differences in, in the density caused by freshwater and saltwater. Anyway, the, it took until pretty far along in the 20th century to get enough information together and to get instruments in the deep sea that could measure and, and document the flow of deep sea currents. And we, the picture is far from perfect, but we know enough to know, as you have described it, the great ocean conveyor belt of cold and warm currents that shape the climate in ways that right now favor us. But if you nudge that system, even a little bit, you alter the whole character of places where people dwell. Of Particularly course, Europe. <laughs> yes, well, the, if the Gulf Stream yeah. changes direction, and it has in times past, really driven by natural causes. This one is something where we have our signature on the changes. Are, are any any sign that those changes in, in thermohaline circulation are gonna bite us here in, you know, within 
recent or not recent, or, you know, immediate memory in, in, in you know in time, oh, 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Well, the evidence is clear that that circulation is changing, and we need to be prepared to adapt not just for the changing currents and the and the impact that will have on temperature in Europe and elsewhere. But the thing is, now we can see as we couldn't before how everything connects. We once thought, when I was a, a young scientist, the phenomenon off the coast of Peru called El Nino was localized. It's only as we gathered increasing information that this cyclical changes of, of, of the currents along the west coast of South America has global impact. Right. In, it influences drought and flooding, the, the difference between El Nino and La Nina, all driven by shifts in ocean currents. And that seems like just a physical phenomenon, but we're now at a stage where the physicists and the chemists and the biologists are really mixing it up and understanding that this is a living planet, that the carbon cycle, for example, is driven, well, it's physics and chemistry, but it's the chemistry of life. So we understand that photosynthesis requires a little bit of carbon dioxide to power photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide plus water yields oxygen and sugar, food, mm -hmm. that then goes through the whole food chain of carbohydrates and fats and proteins Nitrogen is involved with proteins, phosphorus, this whole chemistry of life. But until right about now, being able to synthesize the, the chemistry, the physics, the biology into understanding more about how the living planet functions and what we have done to the nature of nature, clear-cutting forests, converting the wild places throughout most of the continents, Antarctica accepted. <laughs> and now understanding we've done it to the ocean too. We've clear cut right. the ocean. 90% right. of many of the big fish are gone. And you think, okay, trees are carbon-based units. They hold the carbon. They sequester carbon in the soil. And when you burn a forest, that carbon is released. When you clear cut a forest, that carbon is released. When you clear cut the ocean, you take out hundreds of millions of tons of krill, of sharks, of tunas, of swordfish, of all the creatures that we call seafood and sea products. You know, we grind up fish for fertilizer. We capture the small fish by the hundred millions of tons, grind it up, and we feed it to chickens and cows and pigs. Mm. We don't even think about that as what we've taken from the sea, but right. when, when it gets mushed up, who would recognize that we're talking about gazillions of no, little I, fish? I, I get it. We're, we're, we're closing in on a break here. I, the, the, the last question I, I, I was very curious to get your take on, you know, we're learning that microplastics in our environment are, are a danger, that uh, many, of these many of these plastics contain and, and release over periods of time. Uh, in particular, hormone bending chemicals and other chemicals that can cause cancers and things. And there can be as many as 90,000 microplastic particles in a single bottle of bottled water. You know, people are starting to get a little nervous about that kind of stuff. But I, but I understand that one of the major sources of my food chain is from fish and that the fish are getting them because the oceans are filled with microplastics. What is the status of our oceans relative to plastics in general and microplastics specifically? Well, 100 years ago, it wasn't a problem because these synthetic materials did not exist. Right. On one hand, they serve us well. And, you know, for medical, for scientific, for everyday uses, packaging. But now that we know the nature of the problem, we really have to do a concerted effort to try to extract what we can of what's already been put in the ocean and do our utmost not to let more escape and to think about different ways to package, different ways to substitute for the, the, the synthetic materials 
that really don't go away. They're around for not just decades or centuries, but for thousands of years. And once they're in the ocean, they're hard to pull back when they get down to these tiny little pieces. And not just just uh, micro, but nanoplastics mm. that are tiny enough to appear in our bloodstream. They're in the air, <laughs> the beer, or the water, or the soda that you drink. They're there. Mm. And mm. it's a fact. Yeah. But at least knowing that we've got a problem helps. Yeah, it seems, it seems like a starting point. Dr. Sylvia Earle, the new book is The National Geographic Ocean, a global odyssey. Mission-blue.org is the website. Sylvia Earle with an E at the end on Twitter and Mission Blue on Twitter. Dr. Earle, thank you so much for the great work you're doing and for dropping by to talk with us. Oh, it's great to be part of the action. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Back at you.